Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabari here, and I'm doing a movie review this week. It's a sci-fi action-adventure with some comedy elements in the mix called Cherry 2000. It's a story about a young businessman who has a sexy, young, beautiful woman who turns out to be an android named Cherry 2000, who one night was short-circuited and hired a repairman to fix her. Only one problem was the model that he had was a limited edition. So the only way to find a duplicate is to hire a sexy bounty hunter or at this rate a tracker named Edith or E. Johnson to go all the way to Zone 7 to replace her. And this was the uh, a feature film debuted by Steve Stajarnot, who went on to direct the film Miracle Mile, yeah, which is basically a love story um, mixed in with a disaster film. Yeah, <laughs> which of course that that was a great film uh, that came out a year later after this. Which yeah, this movie actually had sat on the shelf for three years since this movie was filmed in 1985 yeah, the year I was born and they were trying to find a 1986 release but that never happened because Orion was just going through a lot of scheduled conflicts and they didn't know what to do with it at the time and plus you know she was doing a lot of films uh, later in her career because at the time she was doing the movie something wild and that got released in 86 by Orion Pictures. Not to mention they were trying to find a release for this movie until suddenly it wants up straight to video on November 17, 1988 from Orion Home Video. So that was probably the only way they could release this you know, due to the fact that she was now becoming a rising star for the movie Working Girl back in 1988. Yeah, plus she was being nominated for an Oscar. So it seems like now she was doing some different roles instead of just doing mostly these kind of roles. And yeah, I, I thought she was very good in this film, despite the fact that, you know, she sort of disowned this movie. I mean, because at least this is probably the first film where she got to play a tough role. Yeah, she had lovely short red hair, and she has a bunch of guns, and she actually has... Uh, a Mustang right here, which is also in the cover. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, this was, um, this used to be played on cable a lot. I, I started watching this on Showtime and the movie channel back when I was four years old. Yeah, hard to believe because I had cable back then and I remember watching this uh, later on TV on, I think it was on KTLA, yeah, it was on KTLA for a while and then it later went on and then later it got released on DVD and VHS by MGM and the last time I saw this movie it was on IFC and that's when I taped the film because I remember watching this many times. And I didn't think the film wasn't that bad. I mean, not great, not perfect, but I think it's um, it's definitely a, a decent flick. Uh, and this is, of course, the new Blu-ray release that came out at the same time as Miracle Mile from Kino Lober, who actually had a deal with uh, MGM and 20th Century Fox to release several of those obscured and and other titles because I know they also had to deal with all the films too as well as Shout Factory to, to release some several MGM libraries so yeah and this is exactly what the blu-ray looks like yeah just a standard uh, KL Studio Classics um, you know, blu-ray uh, disc and yes this is not a reverted uh, Blu-ray um, cover art because I think there were some uh, Kino Lober titles that actually were reverted just like the Shout Factory releases. 
but this is like the only one that didn't have that. I'm not so sure Miracle Mile had the same issue, but I think, yeah, it's pretty much the same. But either way, it looks really cool. I love that, so... Because this was actually the, the theatrical poster they used for the 1986 release, but they never did use it because of... Because they never had a chance to... They never used it because it was never released. But they had a home video poster that looked far different than this. But either way, I'm, I'm glad they put that up because I think it looks a lot better than the, the cheap one that they use from MGM. <laughs> but it was great to see this movie in high definition. I think the quality looks a lot better than than the DVD version, uh, in my opinion. And it has some great extras here. It has the commentary with the director, Steve DeJarnot, with film critic Walter Shaw. Also has a an interview with the actor Tim Thomerson. It even has um, the trailers for both Cherry 2000 and Miracle Mile, and the making of Cherry 2000. So that's all they had in, in this release, right here on the back. So, But let's get to the review. It stars Melanie Griffin, David Andrews, who went on to do some TV shows such as, uh, surprisingly enough, a very similar show, but quite different about a female android called Man and Machine, which was a short-lived series that aired on NBC. So that didn't last that long. But he also had some other films like Fight Club and uh, Terminator Free, Rise of the Machines. Tim Thomerson, who usually plays villain roles in several movies, but I know he's been known for doing films like Tracers. Pamela Gidley, who's been best known for the TV show called Strange Luck with D.B. Sweeney. It was a short-lived series that aired on Fox um, back in 1995. I know she went on to do the film Mafia, which was a, a comedy spoof on gangster films, such as The Godfather and Casino. Yeah, yeah she was very beautiful back then. Harry Carey Jr., Ben Johnson, a legendary actor who's been in some Western films. He was very good in this one, too. Brian James, best known for Blade Runner and several other films. Usually play a lot of villain roles, too. Marsha Bell. Larry Fishburne, of course, later known as Lawrence Fishburne, who had a short role in this movie, and I know he went on to do bigger and better things. Yeah, such as The Matrix. Um... Boys in the Hood, Higher Learning, and every other film that he's been in in his career. Michael C. Gwynn and Jennifer Bogobin, and it's directed by Steve DeJarnot. The movie begins set in the year 2017 in the post-apocalyptic future. We meet a young businessman named Sam Treadwell, who's played by David Andrews, who lives in a futuristic apartment with a young, sexy, attractive, and beautiful woman named Cherry 2000, who happens to be a female android, played by Pamela Gidley, who one night, after long days of work, he came home and decided to have dinner together with Cherry. They had some cheeseburgers and fries with wet wine that uh, Cherry had made for him. Suddenly, she decided to leave the water running in the kitchen, which created some soap bubbles, and they both wound up having sex together until suddenly the water had clogged up her systems, causing her to become short-circuited and stop working altogether. So Sam decided to take her to a repairman to fix her, which unfortunately she was irreparable and it was a limited edition model so the only way to find all of her parts and a replacement for Cherry 2000 was to go all the way to Zone 7. Unfortunately it was located in a dangerous area so after he removed Cherry's optical disc memory 
he hires a he hires a sexy bounty hunter who's very tough named Edith E. Johnson who's played by Melanie Griffin who winds up um, guiding him all the way to Zone 7 inside a uh, inside a Mustang inside a red Mustang that's um, very electronic and and actually can go faster which is very electronic and go a whole lot and actually goes up to 10 miles over a hundred miles per hour so they wound up inside a desert wasteland that's being run by a wasteland overlord named Lester who's played by Tim Thomerson and all of his trenchmen are going after all the tracers so they try to uh, escape from them where suddenly her car is being picked up by a tractor and wants up inside an underground reservoir where we meet an elderly tracker named Six Finger Jake who's played by Ben Johnson so suddenly Sam is being knocked unconscious and been woken up in a 50's style motel known as Sky Ranch that's run by Lester and that's when he meets his ex-girlfriend who changed her name to Ginger of course her real name was Elaine and during that night while staying for dinner Sam begins to witness that Lester is indeed a killer after he killed one of the younger tractors by using a crossbow as a target so then Edith and Jake had finally arrived to save Sam from Lester's guys and they destroyed uh, the Sky Ranch and then after that for, for all the distractions they had, that they had to do they tried to escape from them while uh, Jake had found uh, Cherry's uh, optical disc that's inside a voice box that Sam has been carrying around you know just listening to Cherry's voice everywhere he goes I'm going to the journey to zone 7 where the factory is located but unfortunately the car had broke down they wound up going inside a gas station that's run by Jake's friend Snappy who along with his granddaughter unfortunately they killed Jake and they were and Edith and Sam had escaped inside a yellow light plane that Edith had fixed just so they can go all the way to Zone 7 where they finally found Cherry 2000. Now granted it isn't a perfect film because I think this film should have been written a whole lot better than what it's given but nevertheless I really did enjoy it simply as a guilty pleasure. I mean it just pokes fun on all these sci-fi action adventure films that we've been getting for decades. Yeah. I love Pamela Giddley's performance as Cherry 2000 because you know she is very cute, beautiful, sexy, and attractive. You know, I love all of her expressions that she makes you know, whenever she falls in love with Sam and I thought they had terrific chemistry together you know, with David Andrews uh, playing the role because I thought he did a great job too uh, you know, playing a businessman who just feels very lonely. He doesn't like his job very well. But, I mean, he feels like he just wants to spend more time with her. Because, you know, after all, he was the love of his life. Until he bumps into uh, Edith Johnson, who is tough as nails uh, female body hunter by uh, Melody Griffin. Which came out just at the time when she was doing... Uh, the, the movie uh, Body Double you know, who played a porn actress so it seems to me like she wanted to do something different for a change and and I thought she played her very well I mean I I just really don't understand why she disowned this film uh, I thought she was great and pretty and and very sexy I mean given that uh, that short red hair of hers I thought wow I mean we get to see her do something going around killing all these bad guys that's run by Lester who's portrayed uh, perfectly by uh, Tim Thomerson you know best known for playing villain roles and I, I love that character uh, Ben Johnson playing the 
six finger Jake, but I thought, you know, he's sort of like a fodder figure to uh, Edith, because he actually trained her to do all this, to save uh, the entire world from, from Lester's uh, gains. There were other characters in the film too, including the Gloop Gloop Lawyer, who's played by uh, Lawrence Fishburne who was at a local club, had chosen Sam to find a tractor that was actually located at a hotel. And that turned out to be Edith. Then there's uh, Brian James as Stacy, which was a girl's name. <laughs> Happens to be some, somewhat of an outlaw. Yeah, there's, there's actually a Western theme in this movie, too. Where he has a partner named Bill, who's played by Marshall Bell. who's just basically slow. Instead of having to help him out trying to find Cherry 2000 at uh, Zone 7, he wants up uh, stealing his shotgun and his ammo, and <laughs> and then he beats the shit out of him after that. Yeah. Also, uh, the movie did have a wonderful score by the late great Basil Posadoras. Yeah, I, I love all the scores that they had in the film. That surprisingly enough, the soundtrack was pretty hard to find. Yeah, but either way, it, it was really uh, has a great beat to it. It definitely has all these eighty synthesizers in the mix. It has that feel to it because you know it's it does sound more futuristic than ever. Um, but at times like this, it is predictable, and I think the ending could have been written a whole lot better, especially at that scene where Sam. Edith had just picked up Cherry 2000. They're about to escape by going back inside the plane until all of a sudden Edith ex escapes just to go after Lester and, and his crew, and they did, of course, while uh, Sam and Cherry 2000 are on the plane just to go all the way back home. When then he realized that Edith is going to get killed, so what does he do? He dumps Cherry 2000 by asking her to give him a Pepsi. Wow. So that way he can go back and help Edith out. And guess what he did after that? He didn't came back for Cherry 2000 and he just left her in, into the desert where she wants up staying with Ginger just when she was about to have some sandwiches. Yeah, just after Lester got killed. Oh, brother. I mean... I know, because I knew this was going to happen. I mean, it was so predictable in so many ways that I knew from the fact that Sam was just going to go with Edith instead of Cherry 2000. Oh well, at least he finally got the girl that turned out to be a tough chick with short red hair and a pretty face instead of a pretty girl made out of chips and bolts. But I'll tell you this, it did have some awesome special effects, uh, most of which are practical. A lot of great scenes um, with explosions and, and lots of gun fightings uh, with lots of guns. Because uh, I remember she actually had one of those uh, big guns that she used, even the sniper ones, to shoot all the bad guys. Wow, I mean, considering that uh, Lester and his crew actually had some other machine guns, t too, that's just uh, almost as powerful as hers. <laughs> yeah, and he only had, like, a small gun, seeing that they took his shotgun away. And, yeah, seeing that this movie was made in 1985, I mean, they filmed it that year, and, and it was going to be scheduled for a 1986 release. Man, it would have been a lot different back then, because I think the film would have done so well. If not, then who knows. Because it was supposed to come out just before uh, Melanie Griffin went on to do another film from Ryan Pitchers, which is something wild. And that turned out to be uh, one of her best roles. Yeah, it goes to show you. But either way, it would have been a lot better than we've seen. Otherwise, I thought it was a. F but otherwise, um, it was alright. I mean, it, it was cool. 
some credible stunt work that they use in the film and it just goes to show you that <laughs> that no matter what you find you're always going to get into bigger trouble so anyway I give Cherry 2000 free stars I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later bye